This is CBC Here and Now. We found out today that the province's financial situation is worse than we thought. I'll tell you who the finance minister is targeting for cuts. With their only suspect dead, police say someone out there is not telling the whole truth. Some of these persons who have been interviewed have withheld information. There's certainly no longer that same confidence that I uh, would have had in the past. The federal NDP leader distances himself from Muskrat Falls. Meet the man who wants to help you grow your own pot. We bottle our own beer, we cork our own wine, we probably should grow our own vine as well. Well, we've got some sunshine in the mix for most over the next couple of days. The exception to the extreme east and the extreme west. Your full forecast update just ahead. There's an update from police on their investigation into Courtney Lake's murder. This morning, police named Lake's ex-boyfriend, Philip Smith, as their one and only suspect. The news comes two weeks after Smith killed himself in Bellevue Beach. As here now's Megan McCabe reports, that leaves the Lake family with many unanswered questions. After months of searching and the suicide of the prime suspect, Courtney Lake's mom, Lisa, still doesn't have what she wants. As Courtney's mother, I cannot accept that we may never find her. I cannot accept that her son will never know where his mommy is. Please, I beg everybody and anybody to help us. Lake's family, like police, are sure somebody knows something. RNC Inspector Tom Warren is the lead investigator. He's confident some of the 100 people interviewed by police are not being honest and says what some of them shared contradict the facts. I am of the belief that some of these persons who have been interviewed have withheld information. I am also of the belief that persons who have been identified in our investigation have not spoken with my investigative team. Warren's confident Lake was murdered because she uncharacteristically went off the grid at 7.54 p.m. on June 7th when Smith admitted he picked her up in his truck. New pictures show Smith on Ridge Road by his house 34 minutes after picking Lake up in Mount Pearl. The next morning, he was filling up at Ultramar on Higgins Lime, then heading left on Portugal Cove Road. But Warren says there's no reason to believe Lake was with Smith that morning, and there's no word on what Smith did between that moment, June 8th, and his arrest for breaching court orders almost two weeks later. If Smith did indeed kill Courtney Lake, those gaps plague her mom. The only thing that can ease our heartache is to find Courtney and give her the dignity of a proper burial. My daughter deserves that. We need that. I would love to be able to place flowers on her grave, to sit and talk and tell her how much I miss her and how much I love her. But that won't happen anytime soon unless someone comes through with new information. Megan McCabe, CBC News, St. John's. A man who saw Larry Wellman being shot at the Captain's Quarters Hotel took the stand at the Brandon Phillips murder trial today. Sean Dealey told the court that despite his military training and experience in securing crime scenes, he feared for his own life. Here now is Fred Hutton was in the courtroom today and he joins us now live in our studio. Fred. Anthony, the jury heard from just one witness today, Sean Dealey. He was a guest at the Captain's Quarters Hotel in October of 2015 and says his eyes actually locked with the gunman's just seconds after Larry Wellman was shot during that botched armed robbery. Now, Dealey spent over a decade in the military in the last 24 years working for a security company. He told the court that he has spent quite a bit of time around weapons since his early teens, but feared for his life the night Larry Wellman was shot just a few meters from where he was standing. While returning Turning to the bar that night from the washroom, he heard a commotion and he knew something was wrong. He says when he realized there was a masked man holding a shotgun, he tried to phone 911. He told the court, I thought someone was going to get shot. And sure enough, I heard a pop and the man fell. I looked at the gunman to make sure he wasn't going to put in another shell. He looked at me and I looked at him. He went on to say the gunman seemed to be almost scared or confused. He says his voice cracked. He said, I'm the guy with the gun and I'm desperate and I'm not leaving without the money. 
Dealey testified, I wanted to make sure he wasn't going to clear the chamber and put in another round because I was the only other target there. I was just trying to get out of the line of fire. When asked by Brandon Phillips lawyer Mark Rushi if he had a pretty clear view of the weapon, he responded, the only thing I remember about the weapon is the barrel being pointed at me. He went on to say, you always remember that. Now, Grishy also spent quite a bit of time asking Dealey about Larry Wellman using a small table to try to knock the gun out of the assailant's hands and said that the gun and the table made contact several times. The trial will continue on Wednesday. Dealey's expected to be back briefly on the stand, followed by more first responders. Debbie? Thank you, Fred. That's our Fred Hutton reporting live this evening. Well, there is another highway fatality in this province to tell you about now. A man died after his vehicle went off the road and rolled down an embankment. It happened at about 2.30 this morning on the Trans-Canada Highway between Southbrook and Springdale Junction. Investigators are trying to figure out why the vehicle left the road. The leader of the federal NDP says he's concerned about the Muskrat Falls development. His predecessors, Jack Layton and Tom Mulcair, supported the mega project, but Singh says recent developments have shaken his certainty in the development. There was a time when the project uh, had a, a financial planning and analysis as well as support from Indigenous communities. Now that seems not to be the case with the project doubling in cost and with recently uh, we've seen Inuit leaders that are actually uh, very concerned about the project and in fact we've seen uh, people who are demonstrating being arrested there's certainly no longer that same confidence that i uh, would have had in the past and i should mention we've got a feature interview with the federal leader of the ndp coming up a bit later on here and now ryan's back Nice fall day, a little bit wet late this afternoon. Yeah, more so over the southern Avalon. Mm -hmm. There were a little peck this afternoon when I was up, but are we getting rain overnight? Yeah, well, again, Metro is going to be kind of walking the line between uh, where we'll be seeing rain and where we'll be staying dry. Uh, have a look at the uh, picture here and the satellite and radar over the last three hours. You can see that steadiest precip is indeed off to the south. And as we look over to the northern parts of the Avalon, we're just on the borderline here and we'll uh, zoom in and you you can see where that line has actually been pushing back towards the south. But we're going to kind of walk this line, and I'll show you the future tracker over the next couple of hours as we roll through the overnight tonight. Notice is that uh, precip, eh, even a few wet flurries, not out of the question here through the overnight into the early morning hours of Wednesday. And it's basically from St. John's Metro to the Conception Bay North area back towards the Buren Peninsula, where we have to at least prepare for the chance of some showers tomorrow morning or maybe even a wet flurry. Uh, cloud cover certainly dominant uh, for the eastern half of the island, but sunny start for most across uh, central west and especially west towards the northern peninsula and just a few flurries in western parts of Labrador tomorrow. The northerly winds are certainly going to be a factor here in the east as well, keeping temperatures cool. Uh, but overall, not a bad mid-November day for most of us. We'll have your full weather forecast details with your next three days coming up in just a few minutes. Anthony? Thanks, Ryan. Some very strong words from the finance minister today during his fall fiscal update. He wants agencies, boards and commissions to find ways to make cuts. And it all comes as the deficit and borrowing climb even higher. Here now is Peter Cowan is live from our newsroom. Peter, what's the finance minister trying to say? Well, Anthony, Tom Osborne certainly thinks that core government has a good done a good job of reining in spending. Now he's targeting about the 60% that government spends on agencies, boards and commissions. And what he's promising is legislation this fall that will actually force them to find efficiencies. The problem he says is he's talked to them and some of them just aren't cooperating and won't do it on their own. So in the run up to Christmas, he's sort of put together a naughty and nice list with some of those agencies willing to work with him. Other ones that he says are being difficult. For example, he talked about Nalcor as one of the targets, um, a bit like you might talk about a child who's not willing to eat his vegetables. We've seen attrition measures within departments. We haven't yet seen that with the agencies, boards and commissions. We've delivered the message to them as a government previous to this. The only way we're going to tackle the elephant in the room is by tackling the agencies, boards and commissions. Now, a while ago, I did ask Nalcor CEO Stan Marshall whether or not his uh, company would be finding efficiencies. And he said, in fact, Nalcor is going to be hiring. They're not going to be firing. All right, Peter, we also got some numbers today outlining the province's fiscal situation. You've crunched those numbers. Peter, how bad is it? 
Yeah, unfortunately, the numbers are worse than we expected when they laid out the budget earlier this year. I want to bring up a couple of the key numbers for you. Uh, the first one's the deficit. Everyone's keeping an eye on that. It's risen. It's now going to be $852 billion, sorry, million dollars this year. Uh, that's a jump of $75 million over what we were expecting in the spring. One of the big contributors, there's going to be less money coming in from oil royalties. Uh, the average oil price has been lower than what they forecast, so government is short about a $150 million from the offshore projects. Uh, then there's the big spike in money that we're going to need to borrow this year. Uh, it's almost $300 million more we're going to ask to uh, lenders to give us this year. Uh, the total amount is now at $700 million in terms of borrowing. About half of that increase is thanks to Muskrat Falls. The cost of the project has gone up, so the provinces has to kick in more money. And so that's just another reason right now that the province isn't too happy with Nalcor. Debbie? All right, uh, thank you, Peter. The opposition parties aren't encouraged by the government's plans to rein in spending at agencies and boards and commissions. The interim NDP leader says the finance minister should be more forthcoming about who exactly he's targeting with his proposed new legislation. We do not need more cuts in social services in this province. And I'm very disturbed by the way in which he is just evading the question that's been put to him. Well, another community on the island is slated for resettlement. The Department of Municipal Affairs says it's preparing conditional offers for residents of Snook's Arm on the Baybert Peninsula. According to government, if 90% or more of the residents agree to the offer, the community will be relocated. Last year, Stats Canada counted Snook's Arm as having a population of just 10. That's down from 18 people in 2011. As Canada moves toward legalizing marijuana next year, some entrepreneurs are preparing to cash in, and that includes Ross Barney in St. John's. He wants to get in on the business of selling pot over the counter. I'm, the, I'm one of the managers here at the, at the greenery. Uh, we are, um, my role, I guess, would be just to help Newfoundlanders learn how to grow uh, cannabis in their home with the upcoming uh, decriminalization next year. So we're selling equipment so that uh, if you wanted to take your four plants, which the federal government are dictating to be a, or mandating to be the legal amount of uh, marijuana to grow in your home, I want to give you the equipment to do it yourself. Most Newfoundlanders, we bottle our own beer, we cork our own wine, we probably should grow our own vine as well. Well, it's, a, it's going to be a multi-purpose shop. Uh, one, like I mentioned, we're, we're selling growing products. Two, we're also a, a typical head shop, which allows for smoking, uh, for smoking uh, accessories. Uh, three, we're opening up a cafe so that you can come in for a good cup of coffee and we're going to introduce sandwiches later. We're also going to teach people. So in the back of our store, we're going to have uh, seminars where people can come in, first time growers, and learn from other people in the growing community how to grow their own marijuana. I'd like to follow the same examples that uh, Saskatchewan and Manitoba are looking at right now in which the government will control the stream of the product. So, so the medicine or cannabis, marijuana, will be controlled from a federal level and distributed to small independent business owners like myself. Rather than going with the NLC uh, scheme in which you'll be selling marijuana and, and alcohol in the same, in the same uh, context, which is kind of against what marijuana is like. Not a lot of marijuana smokers want to walk into an NLC to pick up uh, medicine in the morning. You know, there's still a little bit of stigma in that. So I hope that this will be an opportunity to, to create new business here in St. John's, especially when St. John's needs this new business. Was this young boy digging new ground destined for politics? A picture from years ago of federal NDP leader Jugmeet Singh at Bowering Park. He joins us for a feature interview.
a big Parsons Pond boil up in part two of It's Worth the Drive. Sunday at 12.30 and Monday at 7. Welcome back to Here and Now. The leader of the federal NDP, Jagmeet Singh, is in town, part of a cross-country tour, and he joins me now in the studio. Uh, welcome to Here and Now. Thank you very much. So what do you expect to achieve on this trip to St. John's? Well, it's uh, always great to come back home. This is uh, the town that I grew up in when I was a kid. Uh, I want to make sure that I meet folks, uh, hear their concerns, and share a bit of what we have to offer. One of the things I've noticed about Liberals in Newfoundland and Labrador compared to Liberals, MPs I'm talking about across the country, is these are not Bill Morneau, Paul Martin kinds of Liberals. They tend to be on the left of the party. You think of Seamus O'Regan. Most Liberal MPs here believe that government could be a force for good, not necessarily fixated on high taxation levels. How do New Democrats make a dent when you consider the landslide last time? The Liberals seem to be very strong here. Well, a couple of things. One is that at the end of the day, people across the country, and particularly in the Atlantic provinces, are noticing a lack of opposition in the House to hold the government to account. Before, we had some very strong voices from Newfoundland and from the Atlantic region in general to hold the government to their promises. But now that voice is not there. In fact, I think about 50% of Atlantic Canadians voted for a party other than Liberals, but the Liberals got 100% of the seat. So it's not truly a representation of the voice of the people. And that's why I'm going to work really hard to make sure that people have a voice, have a strong voice that represents their interests, and that's fighting hard for them in Ottawa. Part of the work, of course, has to sort of look at what happened in the last election. Uh, you lost uh, Jack Harris, a giant for the NDP. Absolutely. Not that many New Democrats here. Um, also, you uh, lost another against uh, Seamus, uh, Seamus O'Gregan, right? So what do you do uh, to, to beef that up again, right? Because Ryan Cleary, second MP, I don't think people were surprised that Seamus knocked him out, but Jack Harris, that was a huge loss. It was a huge loss. I mean, it was a unique type of election. People were really upset at the Harper era and uh, Prime Minister Harper in terms of his leadership. I think that we're in a new era now. There's a lot of things that the Liberals talked about and promised that weren't really delivered. And in fact, so many of those promises were betrayed. I think there's a great opening for us to actually show that there is a way to dream bigger, to demand better, and to actually build a more inclusive, more just country. It's possible. We can do it. I'm hoping to inspire people to, to see that uh, as a party and as a leader, we can take our country right. forward. There's almost, a, to some degree, a political inferiority complex in Newfoundland and Labrador because it is, after all, only seven seats. And in our system of more than 300 seats, sometimes there's a feeling here, meh, it doesn't really matter. What do you think? Well, for me, it matters. It's personal to me. I mean, I grew up in St. John's. Uh, the Atlantic region is something very special to me. Newfoundland and Labrador have a special place in my heart. And uh, for me, it's always going to be important. So I want to show that importance by being out here, by actually spending time here. And I'm going to ensure that we have a strong foot forward so they actually win back some seats right. here. And you should be careful now because I saw that you were bragging that you're a townie. <laughs> a lot of people outside the overpass might think, hey, he's a townie. <laughs> well, I, I just wanted to double down on the fact that I have some, some links here. And, and this is where, you know, I learned how to ride a bike and how to swim. And those are two really big parts of my life now. So I really want to just emphasize that I'm, I'm uh, someone that has a lot of deep connection and love for this area. Last question for you. There's a, a bit of a rift between the federal NDP and the provincial NDP on the whole subject of Muskrat Falls. Back in the day, Jack Layton and Jack Harris uh, favored the project. The provincial wing, no. In fact, they've been fairly consistent in their opposition. The price tag for that mega project has doubled. What's your stance on Muskrat Falls now in 2017? Well, there was a time when the project uh, had a, a financial planning and analysis as well as support from Indigenous communities. Now that seems not to be the case with the project doubling in cost and with recently uh, we've seen Inuit leaders that are actually uh, very concerned about the project and in fact we've seen uh, people who are demonstrating being arrested, there's certainly no longer that same confidence that I uh, would have had in the past. I no longer have that confidence in terms of the support from the Indigenous community. Mm -hmm. So these are things that we need to resolve. We need to make sure that there's actually a true financial costing and that the Indigenous communities are not only consulted but have the consent and support for this project. It sounds, right to, me now, like, sounds to me like you're against Muskrat Falls. Well, right now I'm concerned. I'm concerned about those two pieces and I want to make sure that those are addressed. Uh, they were addressed in the past. It seemed to me that there was strong support from the Indigenous communities and there seemed to be a financial case that was made. Now those are big questions that are looming 
and I, I am not comfortable with a project that doesn't have those things addressed. What I've said with respect to any energy project, there's three criteria. One, it's got to respect uh, the United Nations rights of Indigenous people. Uh, second, it's got to be a project that's in line with our climate change objectives, our climate uh, reduction in terms mm -hmm. of the emissions. And then finally, it's got to create local opportunities. These are criteria that I've used to make decisions on projects. Okay. Jagmeet Singh, thank you very much. My pleasure. Interesting to see him here and hear mm -hmm. him talk right. about Muskrat Falls. He's getting his feet wet as the leader, the new leader, and I guess the next challenge for him, get yeah. a seat in Parliament. Got to get in the House. <laughs> Labrador is honoring 150 of its finest this week. We'll tell you why in just a few minutes. The St. Philip's Women's Institute is a group of doers. Whether they're sewing mastectomy pillows, collecting for the food bank, or hosting card games, this group of incredible women never slow down. With over 25 annual initiatives to their credit and an unwavering sense of dedication, the St. Philip's Women's Institute has been an unstoppable force for building community spirit since 1991. 
This weather update is brought to you by the Take Charge Business Efficiency Program. Over 400 businesses have saved energy and taken charge of their bottom line. Find out how you can too. Well, uh, before we get to the weather, I want to show you something that, uh, of course, I'm a nerd, so I love this, but I think even the non-nerds are going to love this. It's a great visualization of hurricane season, uh, and basically, this is what you get when you combine NASA's satellite data with sophisticated mathematical models to track tiny aerosol particles. We're talking about dust, smoke, and sea salt. Have a look at this. So the hurricanes... Uh, are really drawing up, of course, the sea salt from the ocean. Uh, so those are your white particles. Now, uh, note off to the right-hand part of your screen, all of that dust and sand coming off the Sahara Desert. And, uh, of course, this uh, near the end, you'll see Ophelia, the, the storm form, and blow all that dust up towards the UK. And, of course, uh, before Ophelia hit, there were some great pictures that looked like wow. the UK was on another planet from wow. Mars because it was great. all, the sky was so dusty and, and murky, and that's... Down in the yeah. right bottom corner, that's dust yes. from the Sahara? Amazing. Amazing. It reminds me of the 1960s, like the best screensaver ever. <laughs> <laughs> it's gorgeous. Were computers then? <laughs> Oh, good one, yeah, They Ryan. filled up the whole studio, but <laughs> they were there. That's, That's right. right. Yeah. Um, anyway, if you want to take a closer look at that, I posted it uh, both to Twitter and Facebook today, so you can uh -huh. uh, do that. Uh, so speaking of satellite and uh, data, well, why don't we take a look at this? So this is the satellite and radar data from right now. And our big low that's uh, tracking... It's going to be tracking over the Grand Banks, but uh, boy, I'm glad this isn't winter season because if this was, oh, say a month, six weeks from now, we'd be talking about snow and quite a bit of it uh, over the Avalon Peninsula, the Buren, or perhaps just offshore as this track will be just edging us over the next 24 hours or so. Area of high pressure off to the east and an area of high pressure that's really going to dominate for most of the province over the next 24 hours or so. It's this low that's going to be just grazing, yes, the Avalon, the Buren Peninsula, with precip chances, including the chance of some wet flurries mixing in tonight in through tomorrow. You can see where uh, the dry air is winning the battle right now over Metro with those showers primarily over the southern Avalon. But uh, the battle will be will continue through the overnight tonight and into the early morning hours of Wednesday, where we at least have the chance of seeing some showers mixed with some wet flurries, especially into the early morning hours of Wednesday. If no precip, then certainly the clouds are going, are going to dominate and the winds are going to be gusting 50 to 60 kilometers per hour with temperatures near freezing. So it's really not going to be all that pleasant uh, th right through the day on Wednesday here in the east. Again, starting near the freezing mark uh, for the Avalon and the Buren Peninsula with those onshore winds looking at minus 6 to as is minus 10, even 12 towards Grand Falls, Windsor, low lying areas towards western Newfoundland, also Happy Valley, Goose Bay, Labrador City starting tomorrow in that minus 11 to minus 12 range as well. Note as we roll throughout the day tomorrow, that precip again, I think will edge a little bit further offshore. So the best chance of seeing some of those showers will be into the morning hours. That chance drops off into the afternoon. Winds still gusting near 50 kilometers per hour. The winds, uh, the clouds still dominating, but lots of sunshine for pretty much everyone else. Grand Falls winds are back towards the Humber Valley near Cornerbrook tomorrow around that two degree range. Uh, most of us in that one to two degree range, but note that south coast with that nice northeasterly flow. It'll be the hot spot three, four, maybe even five degrees tomorrow. Tis the season of mid-November. Uh, now as we look into the straits, a uh, bit, bit of high cloud cover into the afternoon. Minus two in the west with a chance of seeing some flurries. The best chance, certainly Labrador City, maybe Churchill Falls. Now into Thursday, again, I think that precip moving offshore. And so Thursday is just a cloudy day an isolated risk of a shower across the metro region, but it looks like that system will be far enough offshore. Looking at, uh, again, more flurries moving up now towards the Nain region with uh, temperatures near minus 3. More flurries in Labrador City at minus 5. Everyone else, not a bad Thursday. Temperatures 2, 3, 4 degrees for most of us. And moving forward into the Friday time period. Well, one system departs and the next one rolls in. That's really the setup we have over the next week or so as uh, things stay pretty active. Flurries will move inland into Labrador. And by late Friday afternoon, we're looking at winds really ramping up in Rackhouse. 
going to be seeing some uh, wet snow mixed with shower chances from Cornerbrook, Stephenville down towards Port Basque by late Friday afternoon, and it's mainly cloudy skies uh, for St. John's up through central and towards southeastern parts of Labrador. More on this and of course your weekend forecast with your long range that's still ahead. Debbie. Thanks, Ryan. Labrador is honoring 150 of its finest this week. The Labradorian of Distinction Awards are going to those who've achieved big things in the big land. It's a new award created by MP Yvonne Jones to mark Canada's 150th anniversary. Here now's Jacob Barker has more. In the land of mountains, woods and snow, our Labrador. The Ode to Labrador, a fitting opening for this award ceremony that sees its creator recognized. Physician Harry Patton wrote the song. Today, he and his son Tony were posthumously recognized for their work as doctors. Grandson Dave Patton accepted the award. So, so it's a complete thrill for me that it is, and to hear it here tonight was just another thrill. I don't really have the words for it. <laughs> Patton says this new award is meaningful in more ways than one. I think it's a marvelous thing that we're recognizing our own. They don't come from any one sort of particular walk of life. The prize was created to mark outstanding achievements in Labrador. The celebration tonight was a way of looking at Labrador from all different aspects and in the same way that a lot of these plays have done. You know, we looked at some social issues, some reasons to laugh, things that Labrador could be. I'm proud because people really love it. They actually want my dog. Labradorians are coming together again. Sometimes we've been divided, but now we're back together again, one people. I think it's extremely valuable, and I think this should be shown to the rest of Canada. I think Labrador is still a forgotten part of Canada. But the deeds and roles these Labradorians have played are not forgotten here. Their achievements for Labrador and for Canada are being honoured at ceremonies throughout Labrador all this week. Another ceremony is being held in Labrador City tonight. Jacob Barker, CBC News, Happy Valley Goose Bay. That's a great idea, the awards, and I've been to Labrador a couple of mm -hmm. times covering the Labrador Winter Games. The pride Absolutely. that they have in Labrador is so evident. So yep. congrats to everybody who picked up the award. Great ceremony. You've heard of Iron Chef, the Bobby Blay of Chopped. Well, tonight there's a new chef battle in town, and it's right here in town. It's called Feed Demons. It starts at 8 o'clock. You can watch it live on the CBCNL Facebook page. And I've got all the details right after the break.
Welcome back. A little bit of fun and competition yes. for you now. From Iron Chef to Beat Bobby Flay to Chopped, Chef Battles are a big hit on network TV. But tonight, CBCNL is bringing the Chef Battle of St. John's, and you can watch it live. Mm -hmm. Feed Demons. It features two chefs, three rounds, and one local charity. And of course, it involves food. So here now, Zach Gowdy has made sure he's going to be there. Zach, why don't you fill us in on this event? Well, you know, it's a special night when I'm wearing my special CBC bow tie. It's lovely. <laughs> so we're already off to a good start. <laughs> but it is going to be a fabulous night of fun and, again, all for a very important cause. Feed Demons. It's just like the chef battles you see on TV, only with local chefs fighting with local ingredients and the proceeds going to help out a local charity along the way. Local food star Mark McCrow, one of the people who's helped us put this together. Uh, Mark, chef, author, and former winner of Chop Canada. Uh, any words of advice for the chefs about to step into the heat of the battle here? Well, yeah, I mean, I did, I did it recently. It's uh, 20 minutes each round, so it's, it goes quick, you know, so <laughs> there's no time to, to fill around. you gotta be, you got to be on your feet, so... Yeah. These guys, of course, the, the, the professional chefs we see working in the city are on their feet all the time, but just how different is it from a night when you know you could get slammed with 10 steak orders or 10 burger orders, but tonight these guys don't know what they're going to be cooking? Well, that's the thing, but these guys do do it every night, so they're, they're up for it. They're going to be they're, they're fast. They know what to do, so it's going to be fun to watch. This is a fun night to showcase again. We've got to introduce some of the members of the local restaurant community, but also for the local food scene. I'm just going to step out of the way so we can show off the pantry items. Uh, Mark... How did, where did you get all this great looking stuff? So we were lucky enough to have uh, Lester's Farm donate some food. We had uh, Fagan's Farm in Churchill Square. Uh, we had the uh, seafood shop in Churchill Square. We had uh, Cisco donate some food and um, Gay's Seed as well. Wow. Yeah. Got some bread from Rocket bread Bakery, from Rocket. got some yeah. cheese from yeah. Five Brothers. Cheese from Five Brothers, Adam Blanchard. No, I should also mention uh, that we this event is in the aid of the Community Food Sharing Association. And in that uh, vein, we took half a food donation that we got from Cisco, a big sponsor, put it into fresh ingredients. But the other half of that donation is down at the back of the room. There you see the restaurant-sized portions there, beans and Cheerios, lots of Quaker oats for the kids. Uh, but yeah, so we gave half that donation over to non-perishable items that's going direct to community food sharing and half in the fresh stuff we're cooking up tonight. Yeah. Um, so not only this is the common pantry, but each round is also going to feature a star local ingredient. This is where the twist comes in. Just tell us about that part, Mark. So yeah, every 20 minutes we got a secret ingredient locally sourced that we're going to break out right before the round starts. I'll introduce it to the chefs and as soon as they get it, that's it, time starts and they go to it. So, so this is the one that they have to incorporate. Yeah, they, have, they have to incorporate that into their dish, that has to be the focal point of the dish. So uh, yeah, it's going to be fun. It's going to be a great event. I can't wait to kick it off. Uh, if you're in town and this sounds like a fun night to you, feel free to come down to Piatto Pizza on Elizabeth Avenue. Tickets are 10 bucks at the door plus a non-perishable food item. And if you don't uh, get a chance to come and be part Part of the audience tonight. Watch us live on CBCNL Facebook. The action starts at 8 o'clock Newfoundland time. Uh, Mark, you're also judging tonight. Uh, did you bring along the most important thing, your appetite? <laughs> I'm ready to judge. Yeah, <laughs> you know, you know it. <laughs> Count on you. Yeah. Hey, maybe if there's a little left. Last yeah. time I didn't. Even I'll, I'll get you in there. I'll this time? Some. <laughs> All, right. All right. Well, thanks, guys. Reporting live from Piatto Pizza. I'm Zach Gowdy. And don't forget, tune in Facebook 8 o'clock. It's going to be hot. You had a fun on Facebook Live. Mm -hmm. right. I was looking inside that pizza oven there and I was sort of I feeling know, the stomach starting to grumble. Good luck to uh, Zach with the show and getting something to eat tonight. <laughs> From salvage to Western France, up next, the story of the glass bottle that drifted across the Atlantic Ocean.
Time to meet our young athlete of the day. This is Kamara White from Grand Falls, Windsor. Kamara is four years old and played soccer for the first time this year. And Kamara played with Exploits Tots Soccer and her position, she was a midfielder. Congratulations Kamara on being today's Young Athlete of the Day. Well, how's this for a fine looking bunch? <laughs> Don't yes. mind the guy with the limp. Uh, we're all decked out in our winter gear and uh, starting something new on the show and we're calling it Two Two Tuesday. Yeah, although there's three toques there, we're only giving two away tonight. <laughs> That's right? right. They are really comfy and mm -hmm. warm. <laughs> you guys look so good and I look so like a doofus. <laughs> No, I wasn't going to say great. that. <laughs> <laughs> no, you had another word. Yeah. No. Uh, they're really sought after, too. We were giving them away last yes. winter, and we yeah, the demand is hot. Yeah. So here's how you get one of these toques uh, today. Uh, basically, we're, we've uh, posted on uh, both uh, Twitter and Facebook. We want to know, the question is today, where in Newfoundland and Labrador was Debbie Cooper born? Aha, uh -huh. toughy. Very mm -hmm. tough. For some. I believe it's come up yeah. on the show in the past. Maybe, right. maybe yeah. once or twice. I, right. Maybe at some open houses, you know. Yeah. Anyway. So your husband and sons are not allowed to win this contest. We have strict <laughs> yeah, rules right. about that kind of <laughs> yeah, thing. That's so right. this posted to your Facebook page and your Twitter account? That's right. Okay. Uh, this week I took the, uh, the honor. So my Facebook page uh, and my Twitter account. And basically you have until 11.59 tonight. In case you're watching us on our YouTube channel later this evening, you still have a chance to win. So uh, all the names who, an uh, who give us the right answer, answer. <laughs> will go into a draw and we'll choose that randomly and we'll announce okay. the winners tomorrow. I have a fake account, so I'm <laughs> going to get in on this. <laughs> nice. <laughs> Tony <laughs> That's Germain. Right. That's yeah. right. Uh, all right. So good luck to everybody. Yeah, we'll see how this works. No Good clues, luck. by Good the luck. way. Yeah. No clues, right? Don't get in touch with me. Yeah, that's right. Uh, she cannot be bribed. So, uh, okay, let's have a look at the... We're doing the weather now, right, guys? Uh, almost hard, hard to remember. I have toque on the brain. Uh, here is a look at uh, current temperatures from across the country. And again, uh, looks, for the most part, that coldest air has retreated to the north. Uh, tell that to the folks in... Uh, Fort McMurray and of course Labrador City where it's minus 13 right now. Lots of lows on the playing field and it is uh, going to be quite active over the next couple of days certainly. Uh, this is the low we're going to be watching as we roll into the Friday time period. That's going to be moving in. We have another low that's coming in along the jet uh, that's still out into the Pacific. That's going to be our weekend system and so yeah really uh, especially into the Friday, Saturday, Sunday time period things are going to be quite active. Uh, this is the main player over the next 48 hours which is generally kind of quiet for most of us, except for the Avalon, where we, again, we have those uh, shower and flurry chances tonight into Wednesday morning. Those chances really start to drop off as we move into the Wednesday afternoon time period and even Thursdays. It looks like that system will be far enough offshore. Certainly the risk's still there, but forecast models keeping it, uh, yeah, just offshore. I'd be sweating a little more if this was uh, a month from now and that was all snow, but uh, right now, again, expect clouds, certainly some shower chances in there. Uh, this area of high pressure will uh, continue to dominate for most of us, and as we roll into the later stages of Thursday, flurries moving into Labrador City, uh, I should say the north coast after continuing in Labrador City, and then watch your timeline here. By the time we get to Friday afternoon, this system's starting to move in to southwestern Newfoundland. So a quick look at the next three in case you missed it earlier, uh, where I did uh, give a little, few more details on those uh, three days. And again, you can see with the clouds thickening up on Friday and those precip chances moving into the Cornerbrook region uh, by the time we get to Friday afternoon. So this is where, yeah, things are a little interesting for your weekend time period. So Friday night, heads up, we've got some showers moving in by Saturday morning. It looks like we could even see some wet flurries. Central Newfoundland, the West Coast, Northern Peninsula, and of course Labrador. As the cold air wraps in along the other side of the system, late Saturday afternoon into the evening, flurries possible into the St. John's and Metro region uh, as that cold air really funnels in around this system. That's, that low will depart, we'll have a brief break, and then another system comes in for Monday. So yes, active. 
Certainly. Uh, lots of precip chances. Temperatures kind of riding just below seasonal over the next few days. Uh, and again, those flurry chances late Saturday here in the east and then into early Sunday morning. Perhaps some Sunday afternoon sunshine. We'll keep our uh, hat hung on that one uh, at least for the next couple of days with the Monday. Uh, some showers back in the mix and you can see central Newfoundland uh, much of the same. Western Newfoundland has our best chance of seeing some sunshine uh, on uh, Sunday. And as we look ahead to uh, Labrador, you can see where the weekend not looking too, too bad, but certainly uh, watching for that uh, system to move back in for Sunday into Monday. Well, this next story makes the world seem just a little bit smaller, something like that satellite shot that Ryan right. showed. Right, the swirling and the twirling. <laughs> Think about this as you hear about this story. Last year, a 10-year-old from Salvage asked his dad, a crab fisherman, to throw a glass bottle into the North Atlantic. And as it turns out, a woman in western France found that bottle after it twirled around in the Atlantic and landed in France. And through the power of social media, she tracked down the Newfoundland family behind that bottle. CBC News Network's Heather Hiscox spoke to everybody involved this morning, starting with a woman who found the message. <laughs> there it's it here. is. It was on the beach. Um, we just opened at home only. We wait to be home. Um, it was funny. <laughs> so we put on Facebook photos, pictures of the bottle and message. What does the message say? Um, it's um, hello friends, uh, it's Devon, uh, he lives in Selvage, he likes to go to fishing with his dad. Um, um, we look it, we lucky to find the bottle. <laughs> um, it's nine years and the weather is good and bad. <laughs> that was funny. So that's what the note said. Devon, I don't even know if you remember this because you dropped it in the water in May of 2016 when you wrote that. You were only nine when you did that. Now you're 10. What did you think? Would it, what, mm -hmm. Tell me about writing the note and what you thought would happen to your message. Every bit, every story I write, write in school, I'm basically writing with fishing. So I came up with that and then what I thought was going to happen to the bottle was that he was going to sink. <laughs> well, it did not do that. So in you went, Emily. You, you went with your, your husband, Devin's dad, dropped it in. He's a crab fisherman and sent it off. And then what did you think, Emily, mom, when, when you said did, about the whole idea? We didn't think it would get very far ourselves. We, we figured with a glass bottle it would get broke up by the waves and that on the shore somewhere or that's pretty much it with the bottle we we didn't think it was going to go far tell me about finding uh, how you found out that the bottle had arrived in france um, um people were posting all over my facebook right and um they they're messages was coming through my messenger on Facebook. I didn't open any at first because it just said open this and it didn't actually say what it was about. It just said you have to see this. You have to open this. Look at this. And I was like, I don't know what's going on here, but I'm not about to open it. This could be some kind of a scam or something. <laughs> and then after that, somebody had message and they wrote up under it. You need to open this. Devin's message in a bottle was found in France. It's cool and amazing. Cool and amazing. You bet it is. Oh, you seem pretty happy. Yeah, I know. That's pretty special to have uh, somebody find a yeah. bottle like that. Now, in an interesting twist, this story has turned into a bit of an unplanned science experiment. Yeah, that's right. A scientist has reached out to the Marr family to ask about uh, this, a plant-like growth that formed on the bottle during its 18-month journey. Now, the woman in France figured it was some kind of <laughs> decoration. Apparently oh. not. It's kind of interesting. It is. Look at that. So they'll probably get lots of responses from some scientists. Yeah. I wish you could there. actually make it that far with all those things growing on it. <laughs> it's a lot of stuff. All right, uh, turning to some more news this evening. Find a, finding a balance between work and the rest of life has always been hard. And today, Stats Canada released a survey showing that it's getting harder. The number of people satisfied with their work-life balance has dropped significantly in recent years, and it seems that technology is both the, both the cause of and solution to these kinds of problems. Renee Filipponi explains. It's lunchtime at a pub in Toronto's financial district. 
But taking a break from work, even for an hour, is not an easy task for many. I think everybody struggles with it because, uh, you know, a lot of things are thrown at you unexpectedly. So uh, I think you have to have a philosophy around that. And I think saying no a lot matters. And being virtually connected to work 24-7 is part of the reason work-life balance is only deteriorating. It creates this weird obsession that at your fingertips, oh, one more email, I could answer that right now and be done with it. One more email, but that creates a dependency. According to Statistics Canada, the number of people satisfied or very satisfied with their work-life balance dropped 10% over nearly a decade. And women are feeling it more. Just two-thirds are okay with that balance, compared to 70% of men. I've talked to people who set their alarm in the middle of the night so that they can uh, talk to people who are in another country. It's, um, the problem is, is that we, we see availability as, as a career move and saying no as a career limiting move. Along with technology, experts say childcare and caring for elderly parents are adding to the stress, which comes at a cost. People who can't balance have higher stress, they have higher anxiety, they have higher depressed mood, they're more likely to be uh, visit the doctors. And how important is it to you to be able to find that balance? It's extremely important. It's your mental health, right? Otherwise you go a little nuts. And while some blame the fast-paced, tech-infused world for their challenges, Mark Lucas, Bay Street worker and hockey dad, says apps on his phone actually help. It's an app that has all your hockey teams and your hockey schedules for my, my boys and it helps us keep our schedule uh, organized on weekends, otherwise weekends are a disaster. Finding balance, experts say, is a struggle that's getting more complicated and often one only the workers can fix themselves. Renee Filipponi, CBC News, Toronto. Well, how's this for getting your message across? A CBC producer shot video of a woman who found a novel way of expressing her frustration with the long wait for a bus. Oh, something just me you're blocking you. So this video shows a Toronto transit passenger walking directly ahead of a bus she couldn't get on last week because of overcrowding. Not too happy, is she? No, she'd been waiting more than 30 minutes in the cold. Now, through it all, the driver keeps his cool, even as the woman blocks him from passing her. Yeah, that looks really dangerous, though, because the cars coming probably can't see her, right? Yeah, she's... Yeah, that's true. It's probably a dangerous thing, but she eventually returned to the sidewalk, walked away. The TTC is asking riders not to take their complaints literally to the street. No kidding. Saying there are plenty of other ways to get in touch, but I bet you they noticed her. Actually, the other passengers <laughs> noticed her for sure. <laughs> yeah. All right, your beautiful viewer picture of the day. This is another tough one. It was, uh, I'll give you a pretty big clue here. This was taken along the southern shore. But if you can tell me the location, bonus points. That is gorgeous.
Welcome back once again, and we're going to introduce you to Spot Mini, yeah. who's much more than your average dog. Yeah, it's the latest tech from Boston Dynamics. Check out this thing. <laughs> Uh, it, that Boston oh. Dynamics is a robotics firm. That looks almost rude. It sees uh, the camera. Yeah. <laughs> the company is showing it's capable of making a machine with graceful movements. So that's pretty graceful. Apparently, Spot Mini can tackle stairs and other obstacles, but we're just trying to figure out what the actual purpose of this thing is. It's just for fun. It's just because. <laughs> hey, and if you take him for a walk, you don't need to bring a bag. That's right. He's also <laughs> hypoallergenic, <laughs> so uh, no, no, uh, no worries for those with allergies. Yeah. No drool. Yeah. Yeah, no fleas. Oh, it's pretty cool, the though. Big increase in your electrical bill. <laughs> yeah, it's pretty hard for him to fetch, too. That's right, yeah. yeah. Okay, a delegation from uh, the College of the North Atlantic's International Campus in Cotter is visiting our province this week. Yeah, the group includes uh, Rakea Azarea and Mariam al Badr, as well as uh, Ghanem al Kabi. They're all business and human resources students from the college, and you can see them here with their coaches having some fun. Uh, they were also with their coaches, I mentioned Peter Moore and Amy Ireland, and they did a whole bunch of fun stuff. They're off to Grand Falls, Windsor this weekend for CNA's 12th Annual Business Case Competition. Uh, but, of course, they started the visit in St. John's with the uh, proper thing, yeah. a beach uh, fire at Middle Cove and going zip lining at Petty Harbour. I think they're visiting the House of Assembly as yeah. well. So. And then they popped by our studio and yeah. called it a day. Very nice. They had Very a lovely nice. tour. Just enough time to show our uh, viewer picture of the day. Oh. Uh, this one is uh, fantastic. Taken along the southern shore. This is a tough one. Uh, just north of Cape Royal, the pond is called Island Pond, uh -huh. and uh, I mean, this is... I've been to Cape Royal in that area, and uh, it's so beautiful. What a... I guess that would be a sunset, would it? I think, I believe it yeah. is, yeah. No Absolutely steam, that's gorgeous. beautiful. Flat and calm. Thanks, thanks wow. very much to Clyde, and thanks to all of you for joining us tonight. We'll mm -hmm. be back tomorrow. See ya. Good night, Bye everyone. Now.